Okay, well, welcome to week four of Starting Point. Glad that everybody is, uh, it, that is here. Um, we've got a, a great night uh, planned for you, and um, we're going to jump right into the material tonight. I want to do a little bit of review of the last three weeks of Starting Point. Um, and remember, we're going over the course of six weeks. We're doing an overview of the Bible 20 minutes at a time so that you have kind of a 10,000-foot-up view of just exactly what the whole of the Bible uh, teaches so that when you walk in on a Sunday or when you walk into your, your, uh, your home group on any given night that you'll be able to walk in and go, okay, well, this sounds a little bit familiar or I understand a little bit the connection between uh, what Patrick's talking about when he's talking about this Paul guy or when he's talking about this Daniel guy. I understand how it fits in just a little bit because I've heard some of these words before. So some of the familiarity ought to help you a little bit. Um, but week one, uh, remember, we made the statement, if God exists, then nothing is more important than knowing him. If God does not exist, then nothing is more important than forgetting him. And we really made the encouragement that if there's an issue that's really causing uh, strife within your life to where you're going, okay, I'm just not sure if God's really out there, then go figure out what that question is and see if you can find an answer. Because there's an answer out there. And so that very struggle, that tension that is in your life about maybe God's existence, about the, whether you can trust the Bible, those things are in there. Uh, that tension is allowed in your life because God's trying to push you to go seek the answer on that. And so go find the answer. Okay, week two, we talked about this. We looked at, uh, we looked at the Bible. We looked at creation. We looked at the fall of mankind in Genesis chapter 3. And how everybody, uh, Adam and Eve, we tur they, we, they turned their backs on God. We turned our back on God because, let's be honest, we would have done the same thing, right? Okay, and then they were kicked out of the garden. They were kicked out of paradise. It was called the fall of mankind. And humanity really took a big downturn at, at that time. People became, the Bible actually says that, the, that people became uh, more and more like animals. And by the time that Noah came around in Genesis chapter 6, God actually regretted making mankind. That's when the flood came in. Kind of started over with Noah's family. So God, because of his, uh, his unrelenting love for us and his unconditional love for us, he was not going to give up on this relationship that he so much desired to have with mankind. He wasn't going to force a relationship because you can't force a, re a loving relationship. It has to be reciprocal. It has to, to be uh, love from one person to another. And that was God's design. And so God started over with Noah's family, but he really wanted to show himself to the world, and he did that by making the first move toward us. And he did that in the person of Abraham, a very, very unlikely character for God to be able to show himself to the world. God makes this move towards Abraham in Genesis chapter 11. And then it's really through Abraham's family. Abraham... Uh, he has a son. His name is Isaac. Isaac then has a son. His name is Jacob. Um, Jacob is, is, his name is actually changed to Israel. That is where we get the country of Israel, the people of the Israelites. Um, and then Jacob then has Joseph. Joseph moves uh, to Egypt. He rises up into power. And then by the end of Genesis, Genesis chapter 50, there's about a 400-year period of silence where the Hebrew people, also known as the Israelites, um, they just, they, they were like rabbits. I mean, they had tons of kids, and they rose up, and so much so that the Egyptian pharaoh thought, you know what, there are so many darn Hebrews out there that if, if they really want to, they could probably overthrow us. And so he came up with a great plan, and he said, you know what, we're going to enslave all of them, and they're going to build our kingdom." Because Egypt was really about the center of the world at that point. And they wanted to spread their kingdom all over the earth. And they were going to build just an incredible place in, in Egypt. And so they were using the Hebrews to do that. Well, right about that time, uh, God, uh, God came into the life of Moses. And Moses came along. Moses came along. And this is what we talked about uh, in week three was Moses. Moses came along. He was raised in the palace. And then from the palace, he, uh, he rose up as a teenager, and then as he was in the palace, he discovered one day that he wasn't an Egyptian. In fact, he was a, uh, he was a Hebrew, and he sees hundreds of thousands of his relatives enslaved, building this kingdom that 
who he thought was his father, the, the Pharaoh, he had enslaved them all. So Moses goes out, he goes to, to look one day and then kind of survey the people, and he, he goes out and he sees one of, his, uh, one of his relatives being just poorly mistreated, you know, whipped and hit and, ju- and just pushed to the brink of exhaustion. And Moses gets so angry that he uh, ends up killing one of the slave masters. And so in the midst of that, it's found out that Moses did this. And so long story short, Moses runs 400 miles away, and he spends the next 40 years in a place called Midian. Then we get the famous story of God coming to Moses in the midst of a burning bush. And God says to Moses, Moses, you're going to go back to Egypt, and you're going to help free my people. That's going to be your mission. Moses says, you've got the wrong guy. God says, no, I don't. Go. So he goes. And the book of Exodus is really the story of how God loved the, God loved the Hebrews so much that he came in and he did these incredible things. They were called the Ten Plagues, where he was essentially trying to convince the Pharaoh, hey, you need to let these people go. And through the course of the, uh, finally at the Tenth Plague, which was called the Angel of Death, uh, where all of the, the male uh, children were killed in, in, uh, in, I'm sorry, in Egypt. Um, it was finally that last plague that convinced the Pharaoh that, they needed to, that he needed to let the Hebrew people go. So he lets them go. They go into the wilderness. They cross the Red Sea, and finally they have freedom. They don't have a home. They have a promise of a home. It's called the Promised Land. And so that's a little bit of what we're getting into uh, this week in week four, as Moses is leading these 600,000 Hebrew people into the desert, into really an unlivable desert. It's not a place where anybody had populated. In fact, they were taking kind of the long way around to what was known as the promised land. Moses is leading them there. A very long journey through the wilderness. Uh, this is where God gives them the Ten Commandments, and he really begins to set up boundaries and standards for, hey, this is what it means to be my people. And if you're going to be my people, then, then this is, these are the expectations that I have of you. And they aren't just rules to kind of make me happy, but these are rules that are going to make you happy. You know, because I've set a standard, and these are, if you stay within these boundaries, this is the best planned life that you could possibly have as well. So the people rebel because they're people, and they're sinful, and they're selfish, and they try to go back to their old ways because they're just not convinced that God's ever going to come through for them. And it's just, it's a very difficult time. It's, Exodus is chock full of great stories that are so applicable to our own lives in just trying to figure out, you know what, am I going to trust God or am I not going to trust God? And so that was the constant tension with the, with the Hebrew people as they were out in the desert. Well, Moses eventually leads them to the edge of the promised land. They come into the promised land, and once they get to the promised land where the land is flowing, the Bible says it's flowing with milk and honey, the land is fertile, the tree, there's tons of fruit growing on the trees. It's just, it's an, it's an amazing scene. Everybody's happy. They settle into the land. They begin to uh, conquer neighboring territories as God had told them to. And what happens is that they kind of settle in, they get happy, and they sit down and they go, you know what? Life's pretty good. And we really don't need to, do we really need to do all that stuff that God told us to do? Because it's such a burden, and we've got everything we really need. And so, and I know that I relate to it, because typically I don't cry out to God when I have everything that I ever wanted to. It's only when I'm in a time of need where I'm really crying out to God, saying, God, hey, I don't have much left here in the tank. I, I gotta, I'm crying out to you because I don't know what else to do. And so this is, the, this is what happens with the Israelites. They go, you know, I'm not, I'm not so sure we really need God. He delivered us into the promised land. We're thankful. Well, generations go by, and those people that witness these firsthand miracles, uh, they, they witness these miracles firsthand, they forgot about God just more and more. And so there were a set of judges that came in, and, and they said, hey, you know, we want to we be able to rule with some order in the way that God told us to by living by uh, the Word, by living by the Bible. They called it the Torah. And so the, these judges were really ruling the people. They had a very good system that was set up so that everything would be able to be as fair as they could according to what God's word said. Well, the problem was that, uh, that Israel had all of these neighboring nations, and every single one of them had a king. And so they kind of liked the way that that was. They, they, they wanted someone to look to so that they might go, 
you know what, that's a, that, that's a powerful king, and this king's more powerful than that one, and this one has more territory, and he has more land, and his palace is bigger, and, you know, all things like that. So the Israelites began to cry out for a king, and God said, well, that, I, you really don't need a king. You just need to live by what I've given you, which is, which is the word of God. And the people said, well, that's nice, but we still want a king. And so God says, okay, I'm not going to force you to do it my way again. Remember, this is thematic throughout the Bible. I'm not going to force you to do it my way. And if you're going to have a king, this is the person that I'm choosing. And so God chooses, uh, God chooses a king. They anoint the king. And then really that sets off a series of events over the course of the next about 600 years of really just a, a lot of bad kings. Because what happened was that Israel then split into two nations, Judah as well as Israel. They split the 12 tribes of Israel into 10 tribes over here, two tribes over here. And between those two nations, there were about 35 kings over the course of that time. And of those 35 kings, there were only a few of them that were even decent. And they weren't kings for very long. And because what happens when you give one man too much money and too much power? It goes to his head, right? I mean, it always goes to his head. And he abuses the power, and he gets too much for himself, and, and, and the poor are oppressed, and they're neglected. And so, and what happened with all of these kings is they allowed other uh, they allowed other idols to come in. This was, this was the, the problem uh, in, in the book of Daniel. And so all these other idols are coming in. People are worshiping things. They're going back to the old ways. And, and all along, none of the kings would really follow God's word to the point that it was entirely forgotten. They didn't even know that God's word existed until they found it one day in, in, in a wall. And they reread it and they went, oh my gosh, what, what have we done? Look how far we have strayed away from what God's intention for our lives has been. And so in the midst of that, in the midst of all of those kings, God allowed some special people to come along, and they were called prophets. Now, a prophet is simply a messenger from God, um, a, a, a person that delivers a message from the Lord. Prophets were loners. They didn't have many friends. They often had to go into hiding because the kings always wanted to kill them. The kings, they, 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 they loved them and they hated them because they always told them the truth, whereas everybody else in their life just kind of told them what they wanted to hear. The prophets were there to tell them the truth, and often that, that truth did not make them happy at all. And so, but the prophets essentially had one message for the people as well as for the king. I said, turn back to God or else. Turn back to God or else. He's going to allow you to be taken over by these other people. You've you either got to decide to follow God and his way of doing things, or... You are going to, or God's going to hand you over. And that indeed is what happened. However, there was something else very important going on with the prophets in those days. They also had another message that God was up to something much, much bigger than what was just going on around them with neighboring kingdoms and them being exiled to a, another country and enslaved all over again. And there was a, a consistent message within the prophets that someone was coming that was going to save Israel, that was going to restore Israel, and that, wasn't, that, that he wasn't just going to be someone that redeemed Israel, but he was going to actually redeem the whole earth. That he was going to be a king for everyone, that everyone would be able to follow. And there are some passages, uh, I'm just going to read a few of them, that are very familiar. They're called, it, it's called prophecy. The prophets, they prophesied things that were going to happen. And here are some ones that are familiar about uh, the person of Jesus, the Messiah, the promised one that was going to come and, uh, and save. Isaiah 55, 5 says this. It says, Surely you will summon the nations you do not know, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Jeremiah, another prophet in chapter 31 he says this, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. Isaiah 49 says this, He says, It is, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob, and bring back to those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles. 
And this is something that even though the prophet said it, that people in Israel, the Israelites, even the ones that were left that were following uh, the law and, and the prophets, that they didn't quite understand because they understood what the redemption of Israel meant, but they couldn't quite get a grip on what it meant for someone that was coming in to redeem Israel to also be a light to the Gentile people, which a Gentile is simply anyone that is not Jewish. So everyone else, essentially. It says, I will make you, I will also make you a light for the Gentile, for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So not only is God going to open himself up to a relationship with all nations, but he was going to do it through a promised Messiah. One that will not just save Israel, but will be the sacrificial lamb that will be offered up so that all people might be able to uh, escape that angel of death. Because through Christ's death on the cross, essentially, we were passed over as that blood was painted over the doorpost, just like it was back in Egypt when the angel of death was able to pass over those homes so that the Israelite people might be saved. And this enabled all of mankind to enter back into a relationship with God if they chose to. Listen to a few uh, prophecies that are, may, might be a little bit familiar that you hear around Christmas. Isaiah 7, 14 says this. It says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. And remember, this is written like seven or 800 years before Jesus came on the scene. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Okay, if you're trying to write a believable story, you don't include something like that. That's crazy. So when the prophet is writing this out, he's going, really? Is, is this really it? Okay, this is what God said, and so I'm going to write it down. This is the message I'm going to deliver. And then 700 years later, it comes to pass. Micah, another prophet, says this in chapter 5. He says, But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. The little town of Bethlehem, of course, where Jesus was born. Zechariah 9, chapter 9, chapter 9, verse 9, says this. It says, See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And that is the way that Jesus entered into Jerusalem during the final week of his life as he was headed to the cross. I mean, we could spend a full six weeks just on, just on the prophecies, but there were well over a hundred prophecies that were directly about the Messiah, that were directly about Jesus, that there's no way that Jesus could kind of sit down and go, okay, here's one about the Messiah. I'm going to try to do this. I mean, there was, there was so much of it that was out of his control, it would have been impossible. And that's the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The prophets are really the link between those two because they, they enable us to make sense of Jesus. So when you're around River Point and, and Patrick or whoever's on stage is talking about how we can have this relationship with Christ and how, you know, Jesus can be our refuge and he's one that we can run to in a time of trouble and that he wants the best for our lives and that we need to trust him and, and, uh, and follow his plan for our lives, this is what makes Jesus so important is that hundreds of years before, this was God's plan that he was putting down in writing and he used all of this time, all of this history to really show us that, you know what? When we're left on our own, we're going to go another direction than what God wants us to. Genesis chapter 3 tells us that. The entire history of uh, all of the kings who rebelled against God, how the people forgot about God. All of that tells us that we were going to go our own way. And the prophets come in and they say, God is up to something bigger. And he's going to do something so huge that you wouldn't even uh, be able to, to uh, comprehend it if I were to tell you ahead of time. Yet they did, and Jesus came in, and he fulfilled all of these prophecies. All of them. And next week when we talk about Jesus, you know, I want you to be thinking back a little bit to uh, the prophets. And you'll receive uh, some things via email if you want to look into prophecy a little bit more and what the prophets said about Jesus. You'll be able to do that. Uh, but for this week, we want you to walk away with the fact that the prophets came and they foretold all of these things that would happen uh, with Jesus and that those things fulfilled 
the promises that uh, the Old Testament made about Jesus. And because of that, that validates that Jesus was the king of Israel, that he was the Messiah, the one that was to save, the one that was for all people, so that we might be able to enter into a relationship with him. So I hope you enjoyed uh, week four. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about Jesus and just exactly what his life looked like. And then in week six, we're going to talk about a guy named Paul and how this whole thing ends uh, as we finish out the entire Bible over the course of six weeks, 20 minutes at a time. So thanks and have a great week.